work at Microsoft. I lead our Azure Developer Tools team. Uh, we have some of our awesome engineering team here as well. Before I was at Microsoft, I was at Cisco, and I've also seen a lot of my former teammates from Cisco here too. Uh, so my team at Microsoft, we build the Azure SDKs for all the different Azure services in a bunch of different languages. We also build Azure DevTools for Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio, and we work across Microsoft with lots of different teams on API design and developer experience. I live in Austin, and it's super fun to be at a conference in my hometown. I love to knit and crochet, which I like to say is kind of like the original 3D printing. And um, I have three hilarious dogs you can see here, and one of them's uh, displaying one of the amazing dog sweaters that I've knitted. All right, so I wanted to share a little bit about the Azure SDK team before we get into some of the lessons learned. So our, the goal of our team is to create high quality, consistent, and diagnosable APIs when we are really focused on building these idiomatic experiences for developers to connect their applications to Azure. So like we heard in the first talk around Rust and their drive to be really idiomatic, we have the same goals for our SDKs we build in Azure, but we do it across a bunch of different languages. Uh, so some of the things that we deal with when we're building the Azure SDK. The Azure SDKs are built by many, many different service teams. So there's many APIs built by many different teams all over the world, and we're working with all of them on sort of driving this high bar for developer experience. Because of this, we end up shipping hundreds of libraries every month. Uh, libraries for services like Storage and Key Vault and EventGrid and all of our compute services. And we do this in a bunch of different languages. We create libraries in Python, JavaScript, .NET, Java, and Go. And we're really focused on each one of those feeling idiomatic to that developer community. And we spend a lot of time investing in our API guidelines and our API stewardship board because we really believe that starting with a lot of energy at the beginning of the process and focusing on design first really helps us all the way through the delivery lifecycle and ends up with a better end user developer experience. So one of the things we really um, work a lot with in Azure that's kind of unique to Azure is the scale of Azure. Like I said, we're dealing with hundreds of teams all around the globe that we're working with on SDKs and APIs. Multiply that out times all the languages. Now we're into the five, 600, 700 amounts of libraries that we're dealing with. And then when you think about all of the API endpoints and the different API shapes are there, you're getting into the thousands and tens of thousands of API shapes. So there's a lot of different opportunities for things to become hard to use, to be inconsistent, to drift away from guidelines, and we're really working to bring that consistency across all of this. In our SDK team, we have some uh, design guidelines that we share with everyone that we work with, all these different teams. And these are things that we strive for from the beginning of the API process, when we start with teams designing APIs, all the way through to our SDK guidelines. We are focused on developer productivity, so helping devs get up and working quickly and successful on Azure, being idiomatic, which I already talked about, consistency, so striving for similar experiences across different services and within the languages, and avoiding some of those patterns we just saw in the uh, previous talk. Approachable, we want things to be quickly, um, people to be able to quickly get started and learn and start using new services. And diagnosable, this is one of my favorite ones, because as developers, we spend a lot more time troubleshooting and diagnosing our code than writing new code a lot of times. So we feel like diagnosability is really important. And then dependable. We work really hard to avoid breaking changes whenever possible, but when they are needed, having a process and communication that's dev friendly and helps the developers understand how to deal with the breaking changes. Because of this, we are very um, invested in helping drive API design first processes in Azure and in Microsoft. We really believe that they help us strive for a lot of those goals around the end user experience and the consistency and a lot of it help you think ahead to the diagnosability and also the evolution of your API. If you spend more time designing up front, a lot of times you can make decisions that as your API or SDK evolves, you're able to maintain and grow along with the, the business or whatever you're supporting. But we have some challenges in working through this process with API Design First with these hundreds of different teams that we work with. Some of the struggles that we have is that open API can be hard to write, review, and maintain when you're writing it by hand. We see new teams struggle with adopting API guidelines. So sometimes we have many new teams coming up. It's a new service team, it's a new development team that's just come together, 
and they're starting to try to understand the API guidelines, how do they implement them, and how do they do this quickly, because a lot of times they're trying to bring a new product to market very quickly. We also have to work with multiple protocols. So a lot of times we need to offer the same data shape, but offer these across different protocols. We especially see this because we support both our internal developers within Microsoft and our external developers. Sometimes those are same shape, different protocol. And then within all of this, we're always working to be able to scale the efforts of our SDK engineering team and our API architects who are these amazingly knowledgeable and generous architects who spend time with all of these sort of different service teams designing their APIs and SDKs. But as Azure is growing rapidly, we need to be able to scale that and make that really efficient. So we spend time thinking about this. How can we approach some of these challenges? How can we solve some of these problems for ourselves? What are some ways that we can come up with streamlining this for the services that we work with and creating a great experience for our end user developers? We decided that we, we really wanted a way to be able to turn our API guidelines into reusable code. And this could make it much easier and faster to adopt our API guidelines. We want to be able to easily describe our operations in the data shapes. We are a team that builds tools, so I definitely relate to the tool building from the first conversation. And we wanted to think about the developer experience of designing APIs and thinking about it at the time when you're doing that. We need to support a wide range of protocols, and then we want to be able to connect into this great ecosystem of tools for driving things like docs and CLIs and SDKs, everything that OpenAPI spec brings. So one of the tools that came out of this internal work is a project that we've recently open sourced called TypeSpec. And you can find out a lot about it at typespec.io. It's a lightweight language for describing and designing APIs. It borrows a lot from TypeScript in terms of what the language looks like. It has really integra easy integration into your open API tool chain, and we've um, been working on ways to turn your API guidelines into reusable components. So in the graphic here, you can see this is an example of an API <clears throat> described in TypeSpec. And then on the right-hand side is the open API YAML that is emitted from this TypeSpec description. So just to go a little bit deeper into some of the parts of TypeSpec, our main, one of our main goals that we set out to um, accomplish with TypeSpec was create something that's a way to describe APIs at design time that is concise and human readable. And so this is that same view you can see on the, the main.tsp file. This is the type spec file. And you can see, you can look at that and understand, okay, these are the different models, these are the operations. It's pretty easy for people to parse and understand what's going on with the API. This uh, type spec description has about 30 lines of code. When we emit the open API YAML, it's like over 115 or something lines of code, and, and that's a pretty simple one. But we are really committed to interoperability with OpenAPI because the tool system, um, the ecosystem, everything that's there, we want to be able to go back and forth very easily. So creating this way to like have a very easy, human-readable way to describe your API when you're designing it, but then integrate into whichever tool chains you're using. And then the other part is this part about taking your API guidelines and turning them into reusable code. Who here ma helps maintain API guidelines or a style book? I know we asked this in the other ones, right? Everyone has some version of this. And we spend a lot of time and effort on these guidelines and style books and helping people use them, right? So type spec libraries are packages that basically contain different type spec types, decorators, emitters, linters, other reusable pieces of code. And these are where you can take your API guidelines, how you do pagination, how you do versioning, um, how your headers look, and build them into your TypeSpec library, which then people can adopt and use and know that they're doing repeatable patterns. <clears throat> this is a, a couple of really quick examples. So the first one is a decorator for sensitivity that could be defined in a library. And this could be applied to different pieces of data to indicate you know, how this might be handled in logging or encryption or different things like that. The bottom one is a template for pagination. If you're using this from the TypeSpec library, you'll know that every API that's using this is doing pagination the same way. The actual language itself of TypeSpec is very small. There's not a lot in the core language. A lot of things like how we do HTTP and REST are actually defined in our standard library. So we're really um, very um, invested in the library concept and that that's the way that you can extend and customize 
and use TypeSpec to get to your business cases. And then we've also um, built into Visual Studio Code full language support. So there's auto-completion, syntax highlighting, things like that, all the things that just make it easy to write code. So what are some of our lessons learned and feedback? These are things that we've been um, learning as we've been using TypeSpec internally and with the open source community. Some of the feedback that we've had <laughs> is around what users are really valuing about using TypeSpec. So it's simple, it's easy to understand and easy to author. The extensibility model of libraries and different emitters really makes it scalable for teams to work independently, for people to work on um, the things that suit their organization, their business. This intuitive and collaborative part, I think, has been more surprising than we thought in that it's really helping bring people into the API design process earlier because product managers, documentation writers, non-engineers, and multiple engineering teams are able to kind of review and understand the shape of the API together early in that process. And then the tooling is helping people get started you know, it just helps to have it work in a familiar way in tools that they already use. Microsoft Graft is a, another team at Microsoft that we work really closely with. They have a different kind of scalability um, challenge with the Microsoft Graph API. We have all these hundreds of different APIs and libraries. They have one really huge API service that Graph works across. And so we oftentimes exchange ideas and work with them as another API practitioner to uh, work on things like TypeSpec and how we solve some of the similar internal problems. So they've been using it. These are some things they've liked is like using at filter to be able to say which field you can filter on and then a required for create that says, you know, is a decorator that says this field is required to create, to do a create operation. <clears throat> and then some observations from our API architects. Uh, one of the things we've, we've learned the most is that TypeSpec has really sped up our API review process. So who does API reviews? Anyone? Do some? It's time intensive and a lot of work and a lot of care goes into those. And what we found is that by using the reusable building blocks in the TypeSpec libraries, we're able to focus a little bit more on um, the things that impact the end user, a little bit higher level API use cases. We don't have to spend as much time talking about did you use the right error code? We're able to think about like, how is this API gonna be used? How's it, what's it gonna be like for the end user to actually interact with it? And we also see people, because they're a, having an easier time authoring their specs, it gets people involved in the design first approach faster. Um, the other thing that we've seen is really like, we work with services that are across the whole different life cycle. So brand new services that have just started, services that have been around for years, they're all able to adopt different guidelines at very different speeds and make changes at different speeds. And so this is where we've been really learning about the flexibility that a tool like TypeSpec needs to be able to support and work with teams kind of across this whole different life cycle. Okay, I just wanted to go a little bit deeper into sharing how we're using the internal, um, the reusable libraries. So this is uh, for our APIs for the Azure resource provider. This is like, the control plane for Azure. So there's APIs that let you create and manage different resources in Azure. These ARM APIs have really extensive API guidelines. And this is a place where we really strive for consistency because we want those operations to be very consistent as you work across different resources. We're scrolling through a lot of the different API guidelines that, that teams need to follow to implement this. And so this is a place where we've really put energy into building an ARM type spec library that says, if you're using the components from this library, you're going to be sort of automatically falling into the easy place of doing the right thing um, to be in spec with the, with the guidelines. This is an example of what that would actually look like. So this is using like ARM resource operations and that we're applying it to this. And then we know that the get, you know, any of these operations are going to be using this template and are gonna be using it in the right way to conform to the API specs that are in that long ARM API spec uh, documentation that we have. So this has been one of the things that has really helped teams adopt the guidelines faster, adopt them more accurately, driven consistency, and sped up our API reviews. Okay, so what does it look like? Oh, this is really tiny. Uh, this is what it looks like to get started with TypeSpec. There's basically an install the compiler, and once you're, you've installed the compiler, you can do a TSP init, which initializes your project. 
you can select, like I just selected the generic REST project template. And that's gonna give me uh, my starting set of files, and then I can do a TSP install, which installs dependencies. Now I'm ready to actually you know, edit my type spec. So I can take a look at the main.tsp. Just for time, I'm pasting in a description that I was working on for this widgets API. And then from here, you can basically run compile, and I'm using the OpenAPI3 emitter, which is gonna compile my type spec into OpenAPI3. And from there, you can go on to whatever next step you have. You can generate SDKs, you can take it to, as I do in this example, just to Swagger UI to get a look at like, what the documentation would look like. If you want to just try out authoring type spec, um, it's, you can try it out on our playground. It has a place where you can try authoring it live on the website. It also has a bunch of different examples that you can look at. So uh, type spec is open source. We are really interested in learning with the community and helping build with the community in, in type spec. We have really valued the early feedback that we've gotten from folks through our repo and through the open source conversations that we've had, and we welcome contributions. Uh, we would also just love to hear from you with questions, ideas. We want to learn from all of you as API practitioners and hear about some of the struggles that you've had and um, exchange ideas. So you can find us through GitHub. All of the URLs and links are here. And that's it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.